Join us today during the Jeep Celebration event. Right now, get 20% below MSRP for an average of 15178 under MSRP on the purchase of a 2023 Jeep Grand Cherokee Overland 4xe or Summit 4xe. Not compatible with lease offers or with any other consumer incentive set of offers. 15,178 average based on 20% below average MSRP from all 2023 Grand Cherokee Overland 4xE and Summit 4xE models and dealer stock. Residency restrictions apply. Take retail delivery from dealer stock by 4-1. Jeep is a registered trademark. Hi, this is Scott. If you're a fan of the ancient world, please help us get the word out. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and rate the series on iTunes. Thanks again for listening. The Ancient World Bloodline Episode B-45, Odin Office Something had definitely changed. With Valerian Caesar in the rearview mirror and a defenseless empire spread out before him, Shapur could pretty much do whatever he wanted. And according to Herodian and Cassius Dio, Sassanid intentions were clear. Quote, winning back everything that the ancient Persians had once held as far as the Grecian Sea. Plant the Persian flag on the Hellespont, big Romans not welcome sign in the front yard. I mean, that was pretty much their whole darn reason for being. If that's what the Persians wanted to do, it's hard to picture a better opportunity. Shapur's army was at maximum strength, and there was no real Roman military backstop in either Syria or Anatolia. But instead of an epic race to the Aegean, we get a virtual repeat of 253. A few dozen cities ravaged and burned, and the taking of plunder and slaves. But notably, aside from Nisibis and Cari, no cities were invested with Persian troops. Which seems to suggest that the Sassanids weren't really interested in capturing and holding Roman territory or at least any territory west of the Euphrates. There were two possible explanations. They didn't want it, or they knew they couldn't hold it. And of the two, I'm betting on the latter. Actually, in terms of overextension, the Persians were basically victims of their own success. Since inheriting the Parthian Empire, the Sassanids had conquered additional lands to the east, north, and south, many seized from the decaying Kushan Empire. They were also now directly governing former Parthian vassal kingdoms, including Alemius, Cherusina, and Adiabene. And, of course, you can add the more recent conquests of Iberia, Armenia, and Mesopotamia. With so many troops effectively tied down, maybe they could free up enough to win battles, but not the larger amount needed to stake a more permanent claim. Anatolia would have clearly been a challenge, since the Romans could so easily launch a counterattack. Syria's may be a more open question, though it's a fair amount of coast to defend. The biggest puzzle is probably Egypt rich, close by, and inadequately defended, which are pretty much the exact same factors that had soon appealed to Zenobia. But for whatever reason, as far as we know, the Persians never gave it a stab. Maybe it was an ideological shift or part of a longer-term strategy, but it seems to me that Shapur crunched the numbers and decided to right-size his ambitions. And if annexing Roman provinces was militarily impractical, there was always the option of stripping the Romans of their wealth, their people, and their defenses. Which basically put the Persians on par with the Goths, or, to be fair, with the Romans themselves, whenever they got their occasional impulse to plunder Seleucia or Ctesiphon. So, for all its history and culture, the Roman Near East assumed the role of a glorified cash machine, a convenient place for Shapur to swing by when he wanted to top up his treasury. Whether or not they were claiming new territory, they had pretty infinite latitude. 
and Shapur decided to scatter his troops for a maximum devastation. Raiding parties of various sizes spread out across Syria and Cappadocia, targeting the at least partially restored wealth of the historically wealthy provinces. And while you can't blame Shapur for using this strategy, there was one piece of critical information his own personal experience was lacking. Which is simply this. Even when they're beaten down into the dirt, you can never quite count the Romans out. Just as the Sassanids were dividing their forces, Roman power coalesced in two locations. The first was Samosata, the ancient Comagenian royal capital and home of the 16th Gallic Legion. One of Valerian's chief financial officers, an equestrian named Fulvius Macrianus, leveraged his position and the imperial treasury to rally and organize local troops. He appointed a military commander named Callistus and tasked him with harrying Sassanid raiders until they could eventually be driven off. At the same time, other regional forces gathered around Odenathus. Hearing news of Valerian's capture, the Ras Tadmor adopted emergency powers, resuming his governorship of Syria Phoenice and taking command of local troops. There's no proof that he coordinated with Macrianus or that either man tried to claim sole authority. But regardless, over the next few months, they dealt a one-two punch to the Persians. The first blow was struck on the Cilician coast, when Macrianus's commander Callistus seized not only a huge train of Persian plunder, but also the personal harem of King Shapur, which may not have weakened the Sassanids militarily, but couldn't have been great for morale. Whether or not it factored in, by the spring of 261 AD, the Persians were heading back home. And somewhere between Samosata and Zugma, the retiring army came under attack from the forces of Odenathus. Previous speculation aside, this is the first recorded military conflict between the Palmyrenes and the Sassanids. A critical element of both their forces were the elite heavy cavalry known as cataphracts. Back in episode B-37, I discussed the Persian cataphracts, with corselets, greaves, and a compact helmet that covered the rider's full body, along with protective barding for his horse. By this stage, the Palmyrene cataphracts had adopted similar gear. In fact, according to writer Eric Anderson, the swords, arms, and armor of the elite Palmyrene heavy cavalry very likely had a strong Persian influence. He also notes that, like those of their Sassanid counterparts, the swords of the Palmyrenes were secondary arms, while the lance was their primary weapon. This likely meant that both antagonists used comparable strategies and tactics, with the outcome dependent on numbers, the terrain, the element of surprise, and the skill and luck of their commanders. There was also the disparity in motivation, the Persians basically trying to get back home, and the Palmyrenes eager to get their revenge for the destruction of Dura and Anna. Whatever the conflict's ins and outs, the result was a Palmyrene victory. And though Shapur and his army successfully escaped, the battle left a permanent mark. The Sassanid king lost his veneer of utter invincibility, while Odenathus became the man who drove the Persians out of Syria. The entire campaign is poorly documented, and we don't know why Odenathus was so far north, or why, the next time we hear of Fulvius Macrianus, he appears to be based in Emesa. The reason we hear about Macrianus at all is he decided to convert his own success into a bid for imperial power. Well, actually, it's more complex, 
since the victory really belonged to his ally Callistus, and Macrianus didn't so much elevate himself as have his two sons hailed as co-Augusti. The Sassanids had barely crossed the Euphrates before Macrianus gathered local forces, grabbed his son Macrianus the Younger, and marched off west toward the capital. He left his second son, Quietus, behind in Emesa, in the company of his military commander, now Praetorian prefect, Callistus. All of which raises an issue I've neglected. There was still a sitting emperor back in Rome. In fact, Valerian's son Gallienus had been co-ruling the empire with his father and sons for going on eight years now. And though he gets zero love from the ancient sources, I kind of have a soft spot for the guy. By 261, the emperor Gallienus was 43 years old and had spent his entire imperial career in military conflict. I already mentioned his numerous victories over German and Dacian invaders, but that doesn't even count the Franks, the Sarmatians, and, of course, the imperial usurpers. The capture of his father, Valerian I, had seriously damaged the regime's credibility, and ambitious men across the empire decided to make their play. Among the first was Ingenus, the imperial legate of Pannonia. Back in 258, Gallienus' son, Valerian II, had died under Ingenus' supervision. And now that Ingenus had risen in revolt, the incident looked a bit more suspicious. Either way, Gallienus had raised an army, headed east, and confronted Ingenus near Mursa. The usurper was defeated and either killed himself or was killed soon after by his men. Next to rise up was a Balkan commander by the name of Regalianus, who proclaimed himself imperator, seized local territory, and minted imperial coins. His revolt was crushed by the fortuitous invasion of a Sarmatian tribe called the Roxolani who seized Regalianus' capital of Sirmium and killed the would-be usurper. But even then, Gallienus was forced to march north and repel the Sarmatians near Verona. The most serious threat, by pretty much any measure, was the revolt of Postumus to the west. Marcus Cassianus Latinius Postumus was imperial legate of Lower Germania who leveraged a victory over the Jathungi into a bid for imperial power. The full scenario is pretty complex, but I'll try to cut to the chase. After Valerian was captured by the Persians, Gallienus had elevated his second son, 18-year-old Saloninus, from Caesar to co-Augustus. And when Gallienus rode off to defend the Danube, he left Saloninus behind in Gaul, with his new Praetorian prefect, Silvanus. It's soon after this that Postumus won his victory over the Jathungi. But, okay, two things. First, he engaged them as they were leaving Italy with a slew of ill-gotten gain. And second, after defeating them in battle, Postumus distributed that plunder to his troops. From nearby Cologne, co-emperor Saloninus ordered Postumus to return all the loot. But his troops refused, elevated Postumus to emperor, marched on Cologne, besieged the city, and killed Saloninus and Silvanus. So, just to check in, by 260 AD, the Emperor Gallienus had lost his father to Persian captivity and two sons to Roman treachery. And over the next year, adding insult to injury, Gaul, Germania, Raetia, Britannia, and Hispania all decided to back Postumus for emperor. To his credit, Gallienus didn't offer to quit or execute some paranoid purge or hole up in the palace with a cratter of wine in the last few seasons of Orphan Black. No, he pulled on his boots, strapped on his sword, and set a course to regain his breakaway provinces. 
But then, of course, Gallienus got word that Macrianus was marching on Rome. So he wearily sighed, pivoted east, and prepared to confront the new threat. Now, if you're Odinathus sitting in Syria, you've got a decision to make. Because even doing nothing might be perceived as supporting Macrianus. Gallienus was widely unpopular, always on the verge of being overthrown, and so tied down with events out west that he was barely a factor in the east. So backing a weak and distant emperor wasn't exactly a slam dunk. On the flip side, Macrianus was a big question mark, albeit one with Syrian support, which might complicate Odonathus' ambitions if he ended up on top. In the end, rather than back the wrong horse, Odonathus took the least worst option, remaining silent and secure in Palmyra and seeing how things shook out. He didn't have to wait long to learn the fate of Macrianus. Gallienus's cavalry commander, a respected general named Oriolus, had confronted the rebels some distance from Rome and won a decisive victory. Macrianus and his son were either killed in the battle or ordered their own troops to take their lives rather than surrender to Gallienus. There was just one last untidy snippet a young Augustus and Praetorian prefect who were still holed up back in Emesa. Odinathus, of course, was already moving, seizing the chance to prove his value to the surprisingly resilient Gallienus. Whatever forces he brought to bear were pretty likely overkill. The threat of Palmyrene intervention was more than enough. The prefect Callistus turned on his charge, killed Macrianus' son Quietus, threw his body out over the walls, and surrendered to Odinathus. His fate after this is a bit of a mystery. The Historia Augusta claims he killed many Emesenes and damaged the city, but to what effect is unknown. Either way, the main loose end had been taken care of all thanks to the loyal Odinathus. Gallienus likely had few illusions about just how far that loyalty went, at least if push ever really came to shove. But just like his father, his options were limited, and as a wise friend once told me, if you're ever forced to eat a crap sandwich, there's little point in taking small bites. In other words, grab your umbrellas, folks, because it's about to start raining honorary titles. For those keeping score, Odinathus began as Ras Tadmor and Roman senator, which Valerian embellished with the added distinction of Clarissimus Consularis. To these, Gallienus now added the titles of Dux Orientis or Dux Romanorum, leader of the East or leader of the Romans, and either corrector or restitutor Totius Orientis, governor or restorer of the whole Roman East. While the restitutor may have just marked his victory over the Persians, Dux Orientis appears to have been a much, much bigger deal. According to historian Pat Southern, from the 3rd century onward, the Roman Dux was usually a military commander, with wide-ranging powers over sections of the frontiers that typically embraced more than one province, who was empowered to give orders to provincial governors on both military and civil matters. The title was used where an overall commander needed to organize defense of a large area against a very mobile enemy. By way of comparison, Gallienus would later give a similar title to an equestrian governor named Octavianus, tasked with controlling the long frontier across three North African provinces. Southern also notes that 
if orientus is consistent with oriens, as used a few decades later by Diocletian, it may have implied control over Arabia, Palestinia, Syria, Cilicia, Mesopotamia, and Cyprus. This is obviously the maximum interpretation, and it's not clear what his powers really were, how much territory we're really talking about, or exactly how long his tenure was meant to last. But either way, it was a pretty significant honor. And it also appears that around this time, Odenathus relocated to Emesa. The logic to making such a move was probably pretty straightforward. Considering his new expanded sphere of influence, Palmyra was now too remote. While Emesa served as a convenient nexus between both Syria and the Mediterranean and between Arabia and Anatolia. And while other cities, like Antioch or Tyre, might seem like reasonable alternatives, they also held provincial governors and the potential for unwanted friction. Speaking of unwanted friction, Odenathus had a vested interest in quieting his eastern frontier. While his military victory had laid a foundation, the ducks knew that sticks are often more effective when paired with a few tasty carrots. As Gibbon reports, at the time when the East trembled at the name of Shapur, he received a present not unworthy of the greatest kings. A long train of camels laden with the most rare and valuable merchandise. The rich offering was accompanied by an epistle, respectful but not servile, from Odenathus. What was Shapur's response? Well, according to Gibbon, it went something like this. Who is this Odenathus? said the haughty victor, as he commanded that the present should be cast into the Euphrates. That he thus insolently presumes to write to his lord. If he entertains a hope of mitigating his punishment, let him fall prostrate before the foot of our throne, with his hands bound behind his back. Should he hesitate, swift destruction shall be poured on his head, on his whole race, and on his country. Well, okay, I guess that could have gone better. It's pretty likely that Odenathus had huddled with Gallienus first, since sending an embassy to a foreign power was a role reserved for the emperor. But either way, the generous gesture had basically blown up in his face. Shapur, insulted, had responded in turn, and escalated to threats. Odenathus could have just left it at that, or resorted to an even larger bribe, or basically done what Rome had done since Shapur had first come on the scene. Instead, in Gibbon's wonderful phrasing, the desperate extremity to which the Palmyrene was reduced called into action all the latent powers of his soul. In short, he decided to defend his honor and teach the Sassanids a lesson. At 41, Odenathus was in his prime, recently victorious and newly elevated, and he clearly felt he had the resources to launch an effective campaign. At the moment, the Persians were ill-prepared, complacent from their recent invasion, with their army likely disbanded and returned to the fields. If the Palmyrenes moved quickly, they could reclaim cities, take the fight to the Persian homeland, maybe even rescue the Emperor Valerian from humiliating Persian captivity. Any kind of military success would stiffen the eastern frontier, and maybe even weaken Shapur's own standing within the Persian court. Odenathus felt it was a chance worth taking, and began to assemble his invasion force likely composed of Palmyrenes and Romans, augmented by desert tribesmen. According to the Historia Augusta, he also enlisted family members, including his 22-year-old wife Zenobia and 10-year-old son Hiron. 
In the spring of 262 AD, only two short years since Valerian's capture, Odenoth's army went east. Bound for that infamous graveyard of Roman ambition, the ancient city of Cari. <laughs> <laughs>